This car produces over 1,400 horsepower, largely because it's running on rocket fuel. Back in the 80s, there were no restrictions on the type of fuel cars used, so being F1, the teams took it to the extremes. They used a formula that created massive power and allowed the turbos to be turned up higher than ever before, but just one catch. It was extremely toxic and is known as carcinogenic, not to mention its tendency to cause engines to blow up. We all love the genius innovations that came out of F1 in the 80s. Ground effect, massive turbos and carbon monocoque chassis. The introduction of 1.5 litre turbo engines brought a load of changes in F1, with the most obvious being the huge increase in power. Some of the cars on the grid had as much as 1,500 horsepower. They were absolute rocket ships. A big side effect of the turbos was a massive increase in fuel consumption. The huge turbos pressurized air going into the cylinders, which along with more air needed more fuel. At points, the cars were using more than 300 liters of fuel per race. That's nearly three times what today's cars are allowed to use. The teams needed to find a way to use less fuel. They came up with some ingenious but dangerous solutions. More on that later. In 1984, after a spite of pit stop fires, the FIA banned the refueling of cars during races. With this, they placed a cap on the size of the fuel tank at 220 litres, meaning the drivers had to save a lot of fuel during the race. For drivers, this meant needing to either lift off the throttle way before braking, shifting up earlier, or turning down the turbo's boost pressure. Lifting off the throttle and coasting before braking is the most efficient way to save fuel without losing too much lap time, as the engine is using the most fuel when flat out at the end of a straight. The San Marino Grand Prix in 1985 summed it up perfectly. Senna took pole and led up to lap 57 where he suddenly ground to a halt. He ran out of fuel. Johansson then took the lead in his first race for Ferrari and then, you guessed it, ran out of fuel. The same happened to Brundle, Warwick, Piquet and Bootsen. Bootsen luckily stopped on the pitch tray and actually pushed his car over the line, but not before De Angelis could pass him. Prost actually crossed the finish line in the lead, but was disqualified as he ran out of fuel on the cooldown lap, leaving no fuel left for the compulsory FIA test sample, handing De Angelis his first win. A truly crazy race that showed how difficult it was to save fuel with those huge turbo engines. Of the 26 cars that started the race, only five finished. Obviously, neither the teams nor the drivers liked fuel saving like this, so they sought out another solution. We all love it when F1 engineers come up with a clever way around the rules. Things like active suspension, CVT gearboxes and fins on the inside of wheels. But this is the craziest trick I've heard of. For the designers, the goal is to find a gap between the intent of the rule and what it actually says on paper. The rule stated that the fuel tank could be no larger than 220 litres, but not that it couldn't have more than 220 litres of fuel in the tank. So the teams began using large cooling towers to cool the fuel down as low as minus 30 degrees Celsius. They called it fuel freezing despite the fact that the fuel remained liquid. As we know, when you cool something, it gets smaller. This increased the density of the fuel, allowing the teams to squeeze nearly 250 litres into a 220 litre tank. This allowed the drivers to push harder in the race and have to fuel save less. It also had another benefit, as when injected into the engine, there are effectively more fuel molecules per millilitre of fuel being injected, creating more power. Teams also played around with the chemical makeup of the fuel, doing anything they could to extract more chemical energy from the contents of the fuel tank. BMW were the engine manufacturers for the Brabham team at the time, and they came up with an engine and fuel combination that was able to yield far higher horsepower numbers than anything else on the grid. They actually took inspiration from the fuel used in the Luftwaffe aircraft. It allowed the plane engines to create significantly more power than regular aircraft fuel. BMW managed to get their car to run on a very similar mixture. It bore no resemblance to regular petrol at all. The mixture was just over 80% toluene, rocket fuel to you and me. 
It smelt like paint thinner and has a far superior energy density to regular fuel, leading to massive horsepower numbers. They also added a splash of diesel into the mix. This works to slow the combustion slightly, which means there is a higher average pressure in the cylinder on the ignition stroke. So imagine the pressure in the cylinder from when it first ignites to when the piston has been pushed all the way down. Diesel doesn't make the initial bang any higher pressure, but it keeps the pressure from dropping off so fast, as you can see here, effectively pushing the cylinder down harder for longer. This creates more power whilst keeping reliability high-ish. There was still a lot of engine failures in those days. You may have heard of octane. It's listed on the fuel pumps at the petrol station and essentially is a measure of how much the fuel can be compressed before detonating. In simple terms, if you're burning a higher octane fuel, you can have higher compression in the engine and more power. And so F1 engine designers want to use the highest octane fuel they can get their hands on. This new fuel had an octane rating of 121, nearly 15% higher than the stuff the other teams were putting in their cars. It didn't take them long to copy though, as it had an awful smell and was immediately recognizable as toluene to anyone in the know. Toluene burns more rapidly and creates more heat energy than regular petrol. It also had another effect. It allowed the engineers to turn up the boost pressure on the already massive turbos. The year before, the BMW was using 2.5 bar of pressure. With this new fuel, they could crank it up as high as 5.5 bar. Rumour has it that it broke the dyno at the BMW factory on its first run. They really weren't expecting such a significant power increase. But it's widely agreed that this engine was one of the most powerful ever in F1, over 1400 horsepower. And don't forget, it was a 1.5 litre engine, most likely smaller than the engine in your road car. As ever though, the fuel wasn't cheap. It cost nearly £300 a litre in today's money. Factoring in that the cars do about two to three race distances over a weekend, that comes out to about £200,000 in fuel for a single race weekend. However, the fuel had another huge problem. It was extremely hazardous. Back then, they understood that toluene was carcinogenic and had the engineers wear full safety kit and ventilators when dealing with the fuel. Safe to say, you don't really want to get it on your skin or breathe in the fumes. Back to the Brabham car, and it turned out the very car that led the charge with exotic fuels in the turbo era actually led to its demise. The thing to know about this era of F1 was that the ridiculous 1400 horsepower cars combined with the fuel restrictions led to teams making very light and flimsy cars to keep the performance high and fuel consumption down. The cars were animals and the drivers were constantly risking their lives to gain half a tenth here and there, all in cars that didn't protect particularly well in a crash. In 1985, the week after the Monaco Grand Prix, Elio De Angelis was testing a new wing on the Brabham at Paul Ricard. He was at high speed when the rear wing snapped off. It sent him airborne into the barrier, an awful accident that led to his death a day later in hospital. This was the awful moment of realisation that shook the FIA into tightening up restrictions on engine size and boost pressure and for very good reason. They are amazing cars that extracted the absolute most from drivers controlling them, but these accidents were too common, ultimately leading to this turbo era of F1 coming to a close. So the FIA, back then called the FISA, put in place a rule where cars had to run on fuel that was essentially what you got from the fuel station. But it's never that simple in F1. Most of the teams are partnered with fuel companies. Mercedes with Petronas, Ferrari with Shell, and Renault with BP. They work very closely to develop the fuels and engines together, meaning that you wouldn't get the same power from a Mercedes engine if you put fuel design for a Renault in it. Ferrari actually tested this by running Alonso's car with regular pump fuel and then F1 fuel at their test track. The difference was about a second a lap, which is not quite as big as you might expect. This is very much by design on the FIA's part. Applying the F1 and fuel company engineers to developing more normal fuel means that we will start to see the improvements trickling down to the fuel we put in our cars. Fuel that increases efficiency, damages the planet less, and increases performance. Check out these other videos I think you'll love. Please subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one.